In this video, we're going to talk about a very important algorithm that can be used to construct an orthogonal or orthonormal basis for a given subspace. So first, let's talk about what we mean by an orthogonal basis or orthogonal set. An orthogonal set of non-zero vectors, so we do not include any zero vectors in an orthogonal set, uh, is a set where every vector is orthogonal to every other vector, of course, except itself. So that means that the inner product of any given vector uh, with every other vector in the set is going to be zero. So here's an example in R3 where we're just going to use as the inner product the standard dot product. And sure enough, if I take the first vector and take its dot product with the remaining two, I'm going to get zero. And then if I take the second vector and take the dot product with the remaining one, I get zero. And so because of the symmetry, I don't need to form all of the dot products. I can see then that the third vector dotted with the first vector is zero, and the third vector dotted with the second one is zero. Now, in addition to an orthogonal set, if our set of vectors all have norm 1, so then they are unit vectors, then we call it an orthonormal set. So we have not only is their inner product with each other equal to 0, but or with a different vector equal to 0, but the inner product with itself is equal to 1 because they're unit vectors. And if you have an orthogonal set, in which it turns out it's going to be easier, at least by hand, to calculate an orthogonal set, we can transform that orthogonal set into an orthonormal set by simply taking each vector and dividing it by its norm to make it into a unit vector. So for example, we had our uh, orthogonal set from the first example in R3. So if we just go ahead and calculate the norm of each vector and then divide each vector by its norm, now we have an orthonormal set. So the standard basis vectors uh, in Rn form an orthonormal set, and uh, they also do in R2. Now if we want to get any other orthonormal set in R2, there's really only one way you can go about it. You start with your ij vectors and rotate them through an angle theta. And so what you'll get then are two vectors, which are actually the columns of our rotation matrix, and that should form a new orthonormal set. And we can verify that it's an orthonormal set. Remember, if I take the dot product of u1 with u2, uh, I should get 0. And sure enough, I do, because I'll have a negative sine theta, cosine theta, plus sine theta, cosine theta. And that makes 0. And the dot product of each vector with itself is going to take advantage of the Pythagorean identity and wind up being 1. All right. Well, why are we so interested in orthonormal or orthogonal sets? Well, first of all, they're guaranteed to be linearly independent. And, and in fact, they're as strongly linearly independent as any set can get. Uh, and it's pretty easy to show. It's nice to work with or orthogonal sets. Uh, it's easy to show. Let's start with our dependence equation. And what we'll do is we'll take the inner product of both sides with respect to the v1 vector. So I'll take v1 with this linear combination and v1 with the zero vector. Now the dot product, I mean the inner product with v1 with the zero vector is just going to be zero. And on the left hand side, I can use the additivity and the homogeneity to expand that. 
So I'll have C1 times the inner product of V1 with itself, plus C2, inner product V1 with V2, and so on, all the way up to CK, inner product of V1 with VK. But now we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have an orthogonal set, which means that V, the inner product of V1 with anything except for itself is going to be zero, and the inner product of V1 uh, with itself can't be zero. It's got to be a positive number. And so since all of the other terms drop out to zero, then uh, I'm going to have that C1 times the inner product of V1 with itself equals zero. Well, like we said, inner product of V1 with itself uh, cannot be zero because V1 cannot be zero. V1 cannot be zero because it belongs to an orthogonal set. So we have C1 equal to zero. Now there's nothing special about uh, the vector V1. We could repeat the same analysis. So we could go ahead and take the inner product of both sides with vector V2 or V3 all the way up to VK. And we'll find that each of the C's are going to be zero. So C2 will be zero, C3 is zero, all the way up to CK have to be zero. And that shows that the only solution to the dependence equation is the trivial solution. So we've proved that an orthogonal set has to be linearly independent. Now you may hear the word orthogonal outside of mathematics, and it has a connected uh, meaning. It usually means very separate or very independent. And so here's an example of a quote. The car had two orthogonal issues. The interior was an ugly color, and the engine had a grinding noise when starting. So those are very two separate issues, or orthogonal. So here's a fact, um, and it makes sense. Since an orthogonal set of vectors is linearly independent, uh, then the most that you can have in a vector space V is the dimension of the vector space. Uh, so for example, the maximum number of orthogonal polynomials in P3 would be 4, because the dimension of P3 is 4. Well, what are some other advantages of orthonormal sets? Well, if we have, we're looking at Rn, standard inner product. We have a matrix Q, which has um, k rows and m columns. So we have m columns. Each one of those have k entries. And uh, the columns form an orthonormal set. And if you form the product Q transpose Q, if you think about that, the entries of Q transpose Q along the diagonal are just the inner product of each column with itself. And since it's an orthonormal set, I'll get ones along the diagonal. And then off the diagonal, I'll have an inner product of one column with another different column, which has to be 0. And so in the end, the product is the identity matrix. Now, if Q is a square matrix, so if it's an n by n matrix, and you know that the columns are orthonormal, uh, then uh, Q transpose Q will be the identity operator, identity matrix which tells me that the inverse of a matrix with orthonormal columns is just its transpose. So that's about as easy as it gets in calculating uh, the inverse. You just have uh, the transpose. Now, as unfortunate as it is and confusing, a matrix that has orthonormal orthonormal columns is called an orthogonal matrix. Yes, it would have made much more sense to call it an orthonormal matrix, but that's the name and we're not going to change it. But we can say that the inverse of an orthogonal matrix is its transpose. So now we want to get to our actual algorithm. The idea is if you're given a set of vectors which are linearly independent, we would like to construct a new set of vectors which spans the same space as the original set, but is an orthogonal or orthonormal set. 
So let's see how we can do it. And we'll start in R2. So uh, here we are in R2. I've got two vectors. I didn't draw any axes, but you can assume that the uh, tails of the vectors are at the origin. The circle just represents the unit circle. So we can see that these vectors are not uh, linearly dependent because they're not parallel to each other. So we have linearly independent vectors, but they're also not uh, an orthonormal set. They have the wrong length. They're not unit vectors and they're not orthogonal to each other. So we'd like to create a new set starting with these vectors. And so <laughs> the first thing we're going to do is we're going to fix the length of V1. We are going to replace V1 with V1 divided by its norm. And now I've got a unit vector in the same direction as V1. All right, so at least one thing is fixed. I still have the wrong length for the other vector, and I also have the wrong angle. Well, let's fix the angle. So what I'm going to do is first calculate the projection of V2 onto U1. That would be this vector right here. In fact, let me just highlight that there. So again, this vector right here, for some reason I'm not, oh, that's because it says eraser. I want to highlight. So this vector right here is the projection of V2 on to U1. Now, what we'd like to do is, well, what, would, what is that vector? Well, it's parallel to U1, so it's got to be a multiple of U1. Well, what multiple is it? Well, it's whatever the length is of this side of this right triangle. And so using some trig, the cosine theta times the length of V2, V2 would be the length of V2 would be the hypotenuse, would give me the correct length. And so that would be the multiplier times the vector u1. But cosine theta is just v2 dotted with u1 over their respective lengths. Now the length of u1 is just 1. And the v2 lengths are going to divide out. So I'm just going to be left with the dot product of v2 with u1 times u1. That is the projection of v2 onto v1. That's not the vector that I want, but that's actually the vector that I need to throw away. A little vector addition says that if I add that projection with this vector here, which we're calling u2 prime, I'll get the vector v2. So the vector I want, which is orthogonal to u1, is going to be, well, v2, and then take away this projection onto u1. So after you find the projection, then we form u2 prime by taking v2, subtracting off that vection, that projection, and what's left over is going to be orthogonal to u2. So again, this is the u2 prime. So again, don't be confused by the prime. It doesn't mean derivative. It just means prime in the uh, throughout this course just means it is a uh, quantity which is related to u2. It's not u2, but it's related to it in a, in a natural way. So u2 prime wants to be u2. And what's the difference here? Uh, well, u2 prime has the wrong length. Remember, we're, we were, are trying to get an orthonormal set. So we've got one vector which already has the right length. It's a unit vector. We've got a second vector with the correct angle. It's a 90 degree or pi over 2 angle. It's orthogonal to the original vector, but it has the wrong length. Well, that's easy to fix. We can easily construct a unit vector in the same direction by just taking that u2 prime and dividing it by its norm or its length. And then that gives us an orthonormal set in R2. So it's just a three-step process.
make you know pick the first one v1 make it into a unit vector then form your u2 prime by taking v2 and subtracting off its projection onto u1 and then normalize u2 prime to get your second vector u2 now you've got three steps one two three and that this works not only in r2 in any uh, rn value if you only have two vectors these are the three steps that you would take now let's take a look at what we would do in r3 in three dimensions right so we have three vectors v1 v2 and v3 there they don't all lie in the same plane v1 and v2 are in this rectangle which represents a plane and then v3 is sticking out of the plane. So when we say that they're non coplanar then that is the R3 way of saying that they are linearly independent. We have a linearly independent set and we want to calculate an orthonormal basis starting with those vectors. Well we're going to start with the two vectors in the plane and we're going to repeat the first three steps that we did uh, with the vectors in R2. We're going to go ahead and construct u1 by taking v1 and dividing by its length. Now u1 is a unit vector. It has the correct length. Uh, v2 has the wrong length and the wrong angle, so we'll go ahead and project v2 onto u1, subtract that projection off from v2. That gives us our u2 prime still in the plane right so u2 prime now is this lighter blue colored one it is now orthogonal to the u1 vector and then we just have to normalize it so we have to divide it by its norm and then that makes it into a unit vector so now i have u1 and u2 in the plane are unit vectors and are orthogonal to each other but v3 is not orthogonal to the plane. So how would we uh, construct a vector starting with v3, which would be orthogonal to the plane? Well, it's the same idea. I, what I'd like to do is uh, take v3, project it onto the plane, and then subtract off that projection. What's left over is going to be um, orthogonal to the plane. But the way we're going to do that is we're going to first calculate the projection of v3 onto u1, the projection of v3 onto u2, because those two vectors, when they're added together, they're going to uh, meet at a point directly below v3. That point directly below, below v3 it would be the, the projection then or the head of the projection of v3 onto uh, the plane and so that's what we want to throw away well that happens to be the sum of those two projections so i'm going to take the projection onto u1 subtract that from v3 also the projection onto u2 subtract that from v3 what's left over is going to be orthogonal to the plane and we're going to call that u3 prime so it's not u3 yet why? Because it has the wrong length. But how do we fix that? Um, all right, so again, this is just emphasizing that uh, the sum of those two projections, the projection onto u1 and the projection onto u2, is the vector which is the projection of v3 onto the plane. So that's what we're going to subtract off. So the last thing is to make this u3 vector a unit vector or the u3 prime find a unit vector in the same direction as u3 prime by taking u3 prime and multiplying by 1 over the norm of u3 prime so now we've got an orthonormal basis for r3 so let's just go through this a little bit more, more carefully, algebraically. Uh, so the first three steps again, and this is in, in R3, 
we're the same. We've got, uh, now we have two orthonormal vectors, u1 and u2. They're in the plane, we call the plane pi. We've got a third vector which is sticking out of the plane. So what we want to do is break down that third vector into two components. One that's contained in the plane, so that's the projection onto the plane. And the other one is going to be orthogonal to the plane. And we know that the if I add those two components up, I'll get the v3 vector. So to get the part that I want, I have to start with the v3 and subtract off its projection onto the plane. Well, I'm still going to call w3 is the part in the plane. u3 prime is the part that's orthogonal to the plane. Uh, since w3 is in the plane, uh, it's going to have to be a linear combination of u1 and u2. Remember, those form an orthonormal basis for the plane. And so the question is, how can I figure out what the coefficients need to be? Well, this is where I can use the same technique that we used to show that an orthogonal set is linearly independent. I'll take the inner product of both sides of this equation with respect to, say, u1. If I dot u1 on both sides, well, u1 dotted with v3, we don't know what that is, but u1 dotted with u1 is 1. It's an orthonormal set. U dot, u1 dotted with u2 is 0. And u1 dotted with u3 prime is 0 because it's orthogonal to the plane. And so we're left with c1 is u1 dotted with v3. And we can do the same thing with u2, and we'll get c2 is u2 dotted with v3. So this is the multiplier. This would get multiplied by u1 in order to, so the c1 would be the coefficient uh, that gets multiplied by u1 in order to find the projection of v3 onto u1, and c2 is the coefficient for the projection of v3 onto u2. And that's what we show here. So our bit that's orthogonal to the plane is v3 minus the projection of v3 onto u1, and then minus the projection of v3 onto u2. Now, if we had more vectors, suppose that I was in R5, and I had four vectors that I needed to uh, find, construct an uh, orthogonal set or an orthonormal set uh, that span the same space as those four. Well, once I find u3 prime, or u3 by normalizing u3 prime, what would I do? Well, for my fourth vector, if I had a fourth vector, my u4 prime vector would be what? I would take my v4 and then subtract the projection of v4 onto u1. So that would be what? u1 dotted with v4 times the u1 vector. And then I have to subtract off what? u2 dotted with v4 times the u2 vector. That would be the projection of v4 onto u2. And then I'd have to subtract off the projection of the u3 vector onto v4. I'm sorry, v4 onto the u3 vector. And so I should be writing v4. That's the coefficient on u3. So it's the same process. That's why we call it an algorithm. And so the last step uh, in our algebraic explanation for the three vector case would be, of course, to divide u3 prime by its norm to get an orthonormal set. Now, if we go back here, you can see that uh, in each step, the new vector that you're creating. So remember that u1 was parallel to v1. u2 was a linear combination of v1 and v2. u3, you can see, is a linear combination of v3, u1, and u2. But u2 is a linear combination of v1 and v2. 
So u3 prime is a linear combination of v1, v2, and v3. So as we progress, each and each step we're constructing a an orthogonal basis for the vectors that we've been using up to that point. And so <clears throat> the question comes about, well, what would happen if during this process, suppose that u4 prime turned out to be the zero vector? Well, that would mean that v4 would be equal to this linear combination of u1, u2, and u3. v4 then would be uh, linearly I mean, this set, v4 with u1, u2, and u3, would be linearly dependent. So if you start with a linearly independent set, you're guaranteed that none of the vectors are going to wind up being 0. On the other hand, if you go through this process without knowing if the set is linearly independent, and you end up with a 0 vector, then you know that the set was originally linearly dependent. All right. So now we can generalize this. So the idea is if you're given a set of vectors, k vectors, you're going to construct, using this algorithm, a set of k orthonormal vectors, and the spans are going to be the same. So again, k doesn't have to, just because where we have k vectors doesn't mean they all have k components. They could be you know, four vectors in R12 for example. And so this is the process that uh, we've gone through, written in algorithmic form. The idea is you're going to start with just a u1 being parallel to v1. To get u2, we first take uh, v2, subtract off the projection in the direction of u1, and then we'll have to normalize it. To get u3, you take v3 and subtract its projection onto u1 and subtract its projection onto u2. That gives you u3 prime. Then you normalize that and so on. You can just continue that until you've run out of vectors. Now, the problem with doing that uh, when you're working problems by hand is that uh, in almost every case, when you calculate the normal of a vector, it's going to be an irrational number. And so it's very awkward to um, perform those computations with those radicals uh, and keep everything straight. But it's relatively easy if you don't have to deal with those square roots. And so uh, we can define the projection of uh, v onto u and use a unit vector uh, without using a square root. So because if I have a vector, uh, say, w, which is not a unit vector, well, we could divide it by its length, and that would give me a unit vector. And so if I replace the u vector in this projection equation with w divided by its norm, I now have this expression here. So this is on the outside, that's the u vector. This is the coefficient, the dot product. Each of them have a factor of 1 over the norm of w. So what I'm going to do is bring this uh, norm of w outside, or bring it into the dot product here. And so I'm going to have a fraction now, w dotted with v, over the length or norm of w squared. Well, the norm of w squared is just w dotted with itself. So now we can define when I have a, a the projection of uh, v onto w, when w is just a regular uh, vector of any length, we can define it this way. So we can replace the projection, the simple projection u dotted with v times u, with w dotted with v over w dotted with itself times w. And that gives us the same algorithm, but with that new expression for the projection onto the previous vectors. And now here, 
um, the u's that I'm calculating uh, do not have unit length. They are of some length, and but they are orthogonal to each other. I could turn them into an orthonormal set by dividing by their lengths. So we looked at that in terms of the dot product, but there's nothing special about the dot product. We could replace the, every dot with an inner product. And so that's what we have here. Remember, the inner product will induce a norm. So we can go ahead and normalize, just as we did before. Take v1 divided by its length. That gives us u1. And now the projection of uh, u onto v would be the inner product. Instead of the dot product, the coefficient is the inner product of v with u times u. But otherwise, it's the same algorithm there. Once we go ahead and start with our, say, v2 and subtract off the projection of v2 under u1, I'll get u2 prime, and then I'll normalize it. I would have u to get u3 prime, I'll start with v3, subtract its projection onto u1, and then its projection onto u2, and then normalize that u3 prime, and so on. And again, even in an inner product space, uh, we want to avoid working with the square roots when we're calculating by hand. So again, we can define the projection as of, u on, of v onto u as inner product v with u over inner product u with itself. And that's how we can construct an orthogonal set without too much work.